Hello there, everybody. Uh, by now, you should have hopefully at least read through uh, those excerpts from Hammurabi's code. So what I want to do first in this video is just kind of briefly go through them, um, not necessarily highlighting what they what they say, but rather um, giving you my big takeaways uh, about what these laws um, indicate or signify. Some of the broader themes or trends we see within Hammurabi's code. Um, and then the second part of this video is going to be focused on giving you an overview of the Hammurabi's Code essay you'll be writing in response to this uh, source. So, uh, the first document you had, document B, was an excerpt from uh, the epilogue of Hammurabi's Code. Basically, um, a thing at the end, after all the laws, uh, to give an explanation of where these laws came from and why Hammurabi is establishing these laws. And what's really interesting about this is that, uh, first off, Hammurabi explains why he established these laws. Namely, he says uh, that the strong might not injure the weak in order to protect the window, in order to protect the widows and orphans. I set up these my precious words. So he's explaining how, in his mind, the purpose of the law and the reason why he established the law is to uh, protect the weak from being abused by the strong. Namely, he highlights uh, widows and orphans. So uh, what's interesting about that, he's highlighting women and children, but specifically women and children without uh, any men in their lives to uh, protect them. So what this indicates as well. It indicates that um, this is a more patriarchal society with a higher view, a higher value of placed on men than on women. And we'll see that reflected a number of times in a number of different laws. Um, the other notable thing that uh, Hammurabi highlights in his epilogue is he explains um, why these laws should be taken seriously. And specifically, he cites Shamash. He says, by the command of Shamash, the great God and judge of heaven and earth, let righteousness go forth in the land. So kind of similar to the carving I mentioned that would be at the top of the stele where this would be, where this would be carved, Hammurabi is explaining that these laws come from Shamash, the Mesopotamian god of justice. These laws are meaningful because, again, they come from the god of justice. So those are my big takeaways from document B. Looking at document C, you have four laws here. They all concern uh, the family. And what's interesting about uh, the way Hammurabi's code seems to treat or view the family is that Hammurabi seems to be trying to maintain the traditional family unit and tradition, the traditional family dynamic, where the father is the head of the family uh, and the wife, listen, or wife listens to her husband and the children are obedient to their parents. And we see that in a number of these. First off, laws 129 and 148 um, seek to aim to reinforce uh, the loyalty or the bond between husbands and wives, where you have, I'm going to talk about uh, 148 first before moving on to 129, where with 148, if a man's wife has uh, become ill, he is not allowed to divorce her. He, he can marry another wife, but he still has to take care of his first wife who is sick. So um, that law is kind of, again, interesting and aimed at uh, requiring, making it so that husbands cannot abandon their wives um, in their times of need. 
So kind of similar to the epilogue, this law is also kind of reinforcing the notion that in this society, men were viewed as uh, providers, and it was the belief that women relied on men to support and take care of them. And here you have Hammurabi passing a law saying that if a woman is sick, her husband, even if he marries another woman, still has to take care of her. So again, a law that's still aimed at reinforcing um, the obligations of a husband to his wife. Law 129 then refers to adultery, where if a uh, married woman is caught committing adultery, she and the man she was cheating with would be uh, tied together and thrown into uh, a body of water, uh, probably aimed at killing them and executing them by drowning. So here you see that Hammurabi has a law um, aimed at reinforcing fidelity, the fidelity of wives toward their husbands. What's interesting and notable here is that there is no, there's no law saying that um, husbands cannot commit adultery on their wives. Um, uh, if, a man can, if a man cheats on his wife, he is not executed. Um, the, it's only if a wife cheats on her husband is somebody executed. So this law, not only is it kind of aiming at preserving the traditional family dynamic, but it's also, again, reflecting the, the patriarchal nature of the society, where there's a punishment for women who cheat, but not for men. So that's kind of an interesting takeaway. Um, then laws 168 and 195 refer to the relationship between children and their parents. So law 168 seems aimed at trying to keep uh, and make sure that children obey and respect their parents, namely by um, cutting off the hands of a son. Oh, sorry, that's 195 by mistake. Law 195 is aimed at ensuring their, that children respect their parents by cutting off the hands of a son who strikes his father. But law 168 is meant to reinforce uh, seems meant to reinforce the obligations of parents to their children, namely by requiring a, uh, a judge to sign off or um, allow a person to disinherit their child. Um, so with Law 168 specifically, if, if, if a person, if a man wants to disinherit his child, he has to, he, he has to go to court and get permission from a judge because he has a really good reason in order to get his son disinherited. But if the judge thinks that the finds that the son has not done anything war uh, that warrants him being disinherited or disowned, then he the father cannot disown him. So again, reinforcing the obligations of parents on their children, where parents are only really allowed to cut ties with their children and disown their children for good reasons that, can, that uh, would be proved and agreed upon in court. Uh, document B, these four laws refer to uh, property, crimes against property and property rights. So laws 21 and 23 refer to uh, robbery. And with these laws, you can see one, um, a respect for property rights. A pretty intense respect for property rights. Yeah, the punishment for breaking into a house is death. But also, um, what's interesting is that uh, these laws also indicate that the early establishment of a rudimentary form of like a welfare state or a society where the government has um, some obligation to the people other than just enforcing the law, but some obligation to... Um, provide relief to people. In this case, that'd be law 23, where if a robber is not caught, then the government will replace uh, what was taken. So, and that's something we don't even have in our legal system today. Like if you're robbed and they don't catch the thief, the government doesn't just replace your stuff. Yet in Hammurabi's code, Hammurabi has a law or had a law that said if the person's robbed and they don't catch the thief, the government will replace what was stolen. So that's interesting. And again, it indicates 
um, an early type of relationship between citizens and the government that where the government kind of has an obligation to ensure that its citizens are um, economically whole. And that if there's a crime committed against them economically or they need relief economically, the government will provide that. And then laws 48, 53, 54, these refer to um, notably the relationship between um, debtors and creditors and also uh, property damage. So again, what's interesting here is that again, you have the government taking some form of um, poor or establishing some form of poor relief where if a farmer has borrowed money to plant his field, law 48, and the weather destroys the crop, he does not have to pay his creditors back that year because in the eyes of Hammurabi, it was not his fault that his crop was destroyed. It's not his fault that he's not going to have the money to pay back his creditor. This is a mulligan, just bad luck. Which, again, that is a rather interesting law um, where, again, something goes wrong where a person is unable to pay back a debt and the, the government's just like, yep, your debt's gone. It's not your fault, it's gone. So again, you kind of see the early foundations of what we might call um, a welfare state or uh, a type of society where the government is providing additional services to the people. And then 53, 54 um, establishes, again, reinforces uh, the protection of property rights, how basically if you do something that causes damage to your neighbor's property, you have to pay or compensate your neighbor for the property damage that you cause. Moving on to document E, we have six laws here concerning bodily harm. These ones are rather interesting. So the document E, this is where we get the, the, the phrase eye for an eye. Um, this Hammurabi's code, if you didn't know, is where the saying, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that philosophy comes from. Basically, you see that reflected in laws one in law 196, where if you knock out the eye of a free man, your eye shall be knocked out. So that's kind of the emphasis within Hammurabi's code, where you wrong, if you wrong somebody, that wrong will be committed upon you uh, to make things right. So we kind of see how that is how Hammurabi and the Mesopotamians viewed justice. You do, you do wrong to somebody else, so that wrong or a similar wrong will be committed upon you. What is interesting, though, is if you look at those laws, 196, 199, 209, and 213, is you see that... This legal code does not apply to all Mesopotamians, all subjects of Hammurabi, equally. Notably, um, your, the law will affect you differently depending on your social class. So again, if you look at Law 196, if a free man knocks out the eye of a free man, his eye will be knocked out. But with Law 199, if a free man knocks out the eye of a slave, he shall pay half his value. So here we see a situation where um, if, it's a, if it's two people of equal social class, as in like the perpetrator and the victim are of the same social class, we can see that the punishment is more severe than if the victim is of a lower social class than the perpetrator. Again, if they're equal, the perpetrator um, loses his eye like the victim. If the victim is of a lower rank, the perpetrator pays a fine. We, we can also infer from that is that if we have a situation where the perpetrator is of lower class and the victim is of a higher class, that the punishment would be even more severe. So that is a notable aspect of Hammurabi's code, that it does not apply to everybody equally. Um, the law applies to you differently depending on your social class and depending on the social class of perpetrators and victims in given situations.
from the laws uh, 215 and 218 are also rather interesting. Or they're taking a rather interesting view towards medicine, where if a doctor operates on a person and saves his life, they they get paid. If a doctor operates on somebody and the person dies, then the doctor's hands are cut off. That's rather interesting. Um, but overall, what we can see throughout Hammurabi's code is that there's a heavy emphasis, at least Hammurabi seemed to try and discourage crime through the use of really harsh punishments. And we see that a number in a number of places where a number of crimes are punishable by death. Crimes that are not punishable by death today, or things that aren't even recognized in our legal system as crimes, uh, like adultery, are punished by are punishable with death. So death and uh, like amputations and maimings are a frequent source of punishment in Hammurabi's code. It seemed to reflect that again, Hammurabi was trying to use severe punishments to discourage crime. Uh, and there. Uh, yeah, and we can also see, again, there are a number of instances where this law is trying to reflect the traditional uh, family unit and support traditional family, uh, the, the traditional family dynamic. It's also kind of reinforcing and reflects a society where men were viewed as superior to women, um, and also a society where um, that, does, that does place a heavy emphasis on respecting property rights, and yet also... Um, does have a form of relief for people who are wrong. Anyway, this brings us to your big assignment over Hammurabi's Code, the Hammurabi's Code essay. So what you're doing with this, in a one-page Times New Roman 12-point font typed double-spaced essay, you need to explain whether or not you think that Hammurabi's Code was just, and you will need to provide examples from these attached primary sources to support your answer. So basically, what I'm looking for in this essay, you need to give me a definition of justice. You need to explain what your definition of justice is. What do you, what does justice mean to you? Based on your definition, you need to look at Hammurabi's code. And you need to clearly state if Hammurabi's code, if you think that Hammurabi's code is just or unjust, based on the definition you give me. And then you need to provide examples from those primary sources to support your uh, interpretation. So basically it'd be, I think justice is this, Hammurabi's code is just because these laws support my definition. Or I think justice is this, Hammurabi's code is unjust because these laws go against my definition. That's the general format you're looking for. If we look at the rubric, you're graded on providing a definition of justice. You need to provide, if you're going to evaluate this, this legal system and assess whether or not it's just, you need to give me the criteria that you are using to assess it. So what you need to do then, you need to explain what you think justice is. So that way I know what lens you're viewing this through. You need to clearly state if Hammurabi's code is just or unjust. You need to provide evidence from the primary sources to support your thesis, to support your view. And you need to explain how they support your view. You can't just cite a law. And, it, and just assume that that law speaks for itself as to whether or not it's just or unjust. You need to explain what about that law is just or unjust and how that supports your claim. Um, again, you get, and this is easy points, you get easy points if your paper is one page long and you're graded on spelling and grammar. This assignment is due on Wednesday, August 25th. That is Wednesday, right? Oh, that's not it. Sorry. Yes, Wednesday, August 25th. If you have any questions over this, uh, shoot me an email, pop into my office hours. Um, 
But yeah, I'm I'm interested to see what you guys have to say and what you think about Hammurabi's code. So uh, yeah, and with that, have a good weekend.